We are grateful to God that this morning we are able to be online again with the brethren composing the Church of Christ that meets in Central Brooklyn in New York City. And we pray that we may meet again and worship and not be restricted from access to places where we can assemble freely and not only exercise what is supposedly guaranteed in our Constitution of this country, but more important, to exercise the obedience to God who has said that we must worship him in spirit and in truth and assemble together and remember the Lord in his supper and pray together and do many things, the things that he has commanded us to do as a local congregation. And we will mention some of those things in this very lesson this morning, but we pray for us and we pray for all churches who seek to meet in his name by the apostles' teaching that in all countries, whatever the reason they are being prohibited uh, from worshiping, that they may be able to worship and those who are doing wrong by restraining them, that they may be overcome. And until that time comes, we pray that our faith may endure, that we may endure and continue to bring praise and glory to God as much as possible in spite of all so now we continue with the second part of part two regarding the lesson, the nature of a local church, looking at the lessons on the second version that we preached under this title, simply called The Church. And we have looked last lesson regarding the local church, unlike the universal church that is composed of all Christians in the world, the local church is composed of Christians assembling in a specific location, such as Central Brooklyn here in New York City. Unlike the one universal church, there are many local churches throughout the world. They began at different times and in different places. Wherever the gospel is preached and where people become Christians through faith in Jesus, repentance of sins and confession of Jesus as the Son of God and are baptized, immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, when we become Christians by the gospel in that way, we are added then to the Lord's universal, one universal church. And then in a given location where there are two or three or more gathered, to, willing to gather together and assemble and follow the apostles' teaching in worshiping and working together, then we have a local church that begins. And that is begun by the gospel joining ourselves together. We enter when we voluntarily join and are accepted by a local church. That is, we agree to work and worship together uh, as a local congregation. So the Lord adds us to his universal church, but we agree to function together as a local congregation, not as a Baptist congregation or a Methodist congregation or Presbyterian, or any other type of denomination that are not even mentioned in the Word of God, but we agree to work and worship together as Christians, just Christians. And the world says that you cannot be a Christian without being in a denomination. They tell us that we can, but then they act like we can't. But we must say and affirm that the New Testament teaches that we can be Christians and Christians only, belonging to Jesus' one universal church, and we can join ourselves together into a local congregation that is not denominational, that, that as members of his one church, universal church, we seek to follow only the apostles' teaching and not the traditions and writings of men. And we would affirm further that belonging to a denomination which God is not authorized is unscriptural. If God has not said anything about the Baptist, Methodist, or Presbyterian churches, 
then we dare not belong to them because they are of men, not of God. So I hope this is coming through clearly in these lessons regarding the church in the version 2 that we're preaching. Now we go forward in the lesson today, keeping track of membership uh, is oftentimes inaccurate when it comes, or imperfect when it comes to a local congregation. Sometimes a local congregation might accept someone that at any given time, because of sin in their lives that is unrepented of, God is rejecting. It happened in the case of a brother in Corinth in that local congregation, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality. There is immorality among you and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. That is fornication. That is sexual sin outside of marriage. That someone has his father's wife. So this young man had had sexual relations with his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. So they were proud of this known fornicating brother who had his father's wife and instead of mourning over his sinful condition leading him to repentance, they were glad to have him in their midst as a member of of that local congregation, 1 Corinthians 5, 3. For my on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. Paul said, I have made a decision about this brother based on the word of God. Then he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you, in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the end, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What did he mean by that? What were they supposed to do? Well, were they were supposed to admonish him about his sin, pray for him, and then in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person, a fornicator who has not repented, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So he is calling on them to call this brother to repentance of his fornication and while he is in that sin, not repenting, to not eat with him socially. That's what Paul is calling on them to do in the name of the Lord Jesus. So sometimes churches accept members that should be withdrawn from socially because they continue in sin and prayed for and admonished. And then other times, churches, local churches, reject those who they should accept, that is, Christians in good standing that are, by the grace of God, through their repentance, are walking in the truth, and they should accept these Christians, but they don't. In 3 John 1 and verse 9, 3 John 1 and verse 9, I wrote something, John says, to the church. But Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he, for he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church, out of the assembly. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. 
And so the idea was Diotrephes rejected many people that God accepted. So local churches can make mistakes. And when we make a mistake, accepting whom God does not accept or rejecting whom God accepts, we need to back up humble ourselves before God and one another and carry out what God has said, accepting the righteous and rejecting the unrighteous until they are brought to repentance. Then we have a local church. It consists of both saved and lost. That's what we just noted, like the church at Corinth and the church that Diotrephes was a part of. He needed to repent, but he was still a part of that local church. Uh, we find that the churches throughout to wherever they may be, they consist of people, some who need to repent, uh, that may not be repenting, but they still claim to be a part of these congregations. In Revelation 3 and verse 1, the church at Sardis was one of those congregations. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. He's calling a local church dead. That is separated from him. He says, wake up and strengthen the things that, are, that remain, which were about to die, for I have... For I, have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That is a beautiful verse. Although the church is called dead, he says there is a few of you in that congregation that are still righteous by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus and their obedient faith, and they will walk with me in white, even though the congregation is in a terrible condition with people not repenting uh, where they need to repent. Then we go on to understand that we do not need to be in a local church to be saved. That is, temporarily, when we become a child of God, there may be occasion where we are not in a local church, not because we don't want to be, but because of circumstance. One of those circumstances is there may not be any local church in the place where we live, and this was, uh, or we may not be in a situation where we can uh, seek to attach ourselves to a local congregation. One of those uh, examples is the Ethiopian eunuch who was baptized on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza by Philip. And he was hundreds of miles away from Ethiopia. And whether there was any local church there, uh, he was not able to be involved in one, and maybe there wasn't one, and he would have to start one. But we find the Ethiopian eunuch was added to the Lord's universal church upon his obedience to the gospel, but he was not for a time a member of any local congregation. Acts 8 and verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch. And he baptized him. That is, like Acts 2.38, he baptized him by the authority of Jesus for the forgiveness of his sins. 
When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. At that point, the Lord added the eunuch to his one body of saved people in the world, his universal church. But he was not a member, and maybe for a long time he was not a member, not by his choice, of a local church. If there is a local church that we can meet with without violating our conscience and following those things that are not scriptural, then we need to meet with them. But there may be times that that is not possible. If it is, then... It is not necessary for us to be in a local church if it is beyond our control in order to be saved. The local church also has earthly organization, unlike the universal church. There is no universal world organization other than Jesus ruling by the apostles teaching from heaven. But a local church has organization with elders and Deacons, when they're fully organized with qualified men, elders overseeing and deacons assisting with the work of serving the congregation's spiritual and physical needs. In Acts 14 and verse 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so in every church, Paul appointed qualified men as elders. In Philippians 1 and verse 1, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers, that is the elders or bishops and deacons, the servants that assist them. And so we find that the church has earthly organization and their oversight is confined to those Christians among them to that particular local church. And so there is no authority for a universal pope or any other man or woman or group of men and women to oversee many local churches. Elders are restricted to overseeing the local church among them. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, 1 Peter 5, 2, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, he says to the elders. The flock of God among you, you oversee them, nor yet not as lording it over those who are allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And so he says that the oversight is local. The treasury also is local. That is, we don't send our funds to a universal treasury somewhere far off. We send our funds, collect our funds locally, and then make decisions about helping preachers of the Word of God among us and if we have opportunity in other places and helping saints uh, who are in need among us and if we have opportunities in other places. But this is all done on the local level. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1 now concerning the collection for the saints as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save, as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So we find that the church is to collect money locally for the specified purposes. And that goes into the specific work that the church, a local church, is called upon to do. A local church is an assembly of saints that agrees to worship and work together as the Lord commanded in the apostles' teaching. That is, in contrast, the work of individual Christians, that the work of a local church consists of only those things revealed 
that we should do together as a congregation. When we look at the work of a local churches, it can be categorized into the actions of edification, building up in the faith and worshiping God, evangelism, spreading of the word of God to the lost, and helping needy saints. That are the areas in which a local church is to work. The primary focus of this work is local. It's local first and then it's world secondarily. Specifically, there are nine things authorized for a local church to do in the New Testament. We're going to mention a few here. We may mention them all, but I think we may not. But later on, we will mention them in a later lesson down the road the Lord willing, when we get to the work of a local church. But sadly, there are many who add to this work things that are not authorized in the Word of God. So you have churches having birthday parties, camps for recreation, playing athletic games, and all types of foolishness that is not in the Word of God. And then you have some that take away from these works by not taking the Lord's Supper, Every first day of the week, one of the things we are missing so horribly, along with all the other worship, that our leaders here in New York, they don't care anything about religious liberty and people's desire to serve God, have no concern about that as society is falling apart in this state. And... We see what is happening, that the Lord would have us do these things, and there are many that instead of taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday, they just take it once a month, once every six months, or once every quarter, or whenever they feel like it. And so there are many who don't even follow these things that we will mention here. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, we read this. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. So individually, when someone sins against me or you, we are to go to that offender and communicate humbly with that brother or sister. And if they repent, then all is well. And if he does not listen to you, Take one or two more with you, so that by one, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And so individuals are to act again if a brother or sister does not repent of sinning against another brother or sister. Uh, take one or two with you, so that you may confirm the situation. If they repent, then all is well. If he re- refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So the last part is when the church gets involved in disciplining a brother or sister that is sinned against another and refuses to repent after efforts are made by individual Christians. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It shows that individuals, again, are supposed to take the primary effort in providing for their families, those physical things. If they refuse to do that, we are worse than unbelievers. But in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16, if any, if any woman who is a believer, if any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. In other words, even those women who can provide something for their 
dependent widows and their families are to do it. And then if they can't, if there's no other means, then the local church is to be involved. But what we see today is right just a block from our house or a, about a block and a, or so, uh, every Saturday or so, the church uh, here, uh, some type of denomination, has a food pantry where they hand out food and even some lady, uh, many ladies and many men take this food and they will comment on the streets that they don't even need the food. They still take it. Who knows where they got the food from, this church, but they, it is a social activity that really has nothing to do with people in need. Not one bit. And uh, what the scriptures tell us is that I am responsible. You are responsible individually to do all that we can to provide for our own families. And the church is not to be burdened by providing to people uh, that what individually family members can do. So that's what we have going on. The church has become in many places a social welfare society that really has nothing to do with what God intended. That is mostly spiritual mission that does help saints, that is fellow members who are in need in their families, only when, only when there is no other means possible for them to be helped individually. Then we go on in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Ephesians 4 and verse 11, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists and some as pastors, and pastors are elders, qualified men, according to 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, we'll get to that in another lesson, Lord willing, and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ so these uh, teachers among the local church are to teach the Word of God that we might be built up in the faith and learn to serve in all relationships in our life as God is intended that is edification. Also evangelism. The local church is to spread the gospel far and wide as we have opportunity and ability. Jesus, after he was raised from the dead, Matthew 28 and verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we are to spread the gospel, not spreading the sinner's prayer, but faith, repentance, confession, Jesus as the Son of God, and baptism for the forgiveness of our sins, to become a child of God, to be buried with Christ, raised with him, to the glory of the Father by the grace of God, through our obedient faith. Then we join ourselves together in a local congregation, wherever we may be, Acts 2 and verse 42. After they were baptized into Christ, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That is, the Lord's Supper, remembering the Lord's death until he comes again, and to prayer. And they did this every first day of the week, every Sunday, Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. So they came together to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. They collected money every first day of the week in order to support evangelists preaching the gospel and also to help needy saints among them and elsewhere. 
2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, Paul said, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you, that is the Corinthians. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anybody, to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will, <clears throat> will continue to do so. So they collected money to support gospel preachers and also to help needy saints. That is, collected every first day of the week. Acts 2 and verse 44, after the gospel was preached in Jerusalem, among the saints in Jerusalem, they helped those who were in need. Acts 2.44, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Not only did they help the needy saints among them, they sang together without instruments, without instruments. Ephesians 5 and verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts, with your heart to the Lord. And so they sang together without instruments, praises to God, spiritual songs together. A local church, unlike the universal church, can be divided. It can be divided, and Corinth was sinfully divided. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now if we're to be of the same mind and judgment in a local congregation, we are not to have a bunch of denominations who are contradictory bodies of uh, different churches with different teachings. That just makes all the sense in the world. And even in a local, one local congregation, we're to be of the same mind and the same judgment. For Paul said, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. That is, you're fighting with each other. What were they quarreling about? Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul. I'm in Paul's group. I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Then he says, has Christ been divided? The answer is no. Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Paul saying, I'm not your Savior. Christ is your Savior. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul, by his authority, no, we're baptized by the authority of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He cannot be divided because he just teaches one truth. So it is sinful to divide based upon human personality and human teachings that are against the Word of God. But then that gives the opportunity for the righteous to stand in local churches. And if the division continues unabated without change, we may have to leave a congregation and begin another congregation. And so sometimes division is necessary to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. But we should not be the ones to sinfully divide a congregation for carnal reasons. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19, For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. So then there's a division, but if the righteous continue to stand, even if they need to separate from a local church, then good comes about by standing for the truth. But in general, Sinful division is condemned even in a local church. And so that uh, puts a lie to denominationalism where you have division exalted 
into differing bodies of congregations that contradict one another, and then they claim to accept one another as brethren in Christ. Agree to disagree. None of that in the Word of God. And then finally, our membership is affected by death. When we pass on into eternity, we're no longer members of a local church, and if we have been faithful, we will be missed by that congregation, and uh, such as Stephen. We still remain in Christ if we are faithful departing this life, but we are no longer able to participate in a local church. Acts 8 and verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, that is Stephen, who was stoned to death by his fellow Jews outside of Jerusalem for preaching the gospel. And on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. They grieved about Stephen, did they not? And they made loud lamentation over him. He was missed. He was dearly missed, murdered for his faith, but in paradise where he is now awaiting eternal life. Oh, yes. And where Paul, the persecutor, is who turned to God and obeyed the gospel and became the Apostle Paul by the grace and mercy of God through the saving power of the blood of Jesus. And so we turn to the summary slides. A local church is composed, uh, composed of Christians assembling in a specific location. There are many local churches they begin at different times and places wherever the gospel is preached and people who become Christians band together to work and worship as the Lord commands in the apostles' teaching. We enter when we voluntarily join and are accepted by a local church. No formality involved, but yet there is agreement there. Imperfect human judgment in keeping track of membership, accepting those God rejects or rejecting those God accepts, oftentimes happens in local congregations. Consists of both saved and lost, many in local churches, at times we need to repent of our sins in order to be accepted by God and in harmony with the local church. We do not need to be in a local church to be saved. We do need to be in Jesus' universal church. Uh, in order to be saved, but there may be times where we are not able uh, to be in a local church. Where we are able, then we need to do so. It has earthly organizations with elders and deacons, has a local treasury, has specified collective work, singing, partaking of the Lord's Supper, preaching the Word of God among those things uh, that we covered there. Can be divided sinfully, uh, uh, and that is something that is condemned by the Word of God, although it may allow the righteous to come out and be able to have a local church that is standing more for the Word of God. And at death, our membership is affected. At death, our membership is affected. And unlike the universal church, where if we depart this life in Christ, we have no worries no fears, because we will be with him in eternity. And that's what we need to think about in spite of all that is happening in the world as we draw the lesson to a close. We need to think about that. Am I in Christ? If you have not obeyed the gospel today, that is the most important thing in this world that you can do if you have not done so. There is nothing in this world, not one decision, not one thing that you can do that is more important than to become a child of God through obedience to the gospel, which is God's only power to save you. If you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, that he died for your sins on the cross, has been raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is ruling at God's right hand, that he is God along with the Father and the Son, if you believe that, Repent of your sins. 
Stop going the way of destruction that will only get you to be in eternity with Satan in torment and his followers. Turn to God who loves you and who has freed you from sin if you would turn to him through the blood of Jesus. Confess Jesus as the Son of God before witnesses and be immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins as soon as is humanly possible, that you may be forgiven of your sins by the grace of God, that he will add you to his one saved body, his church, where we are related to God through Christ without any, any human beings between us and God except for our high priest, the Lord Jesus, and his perfect sacrifice. And then abide in the apostles' teaching with a local congregation who respects the apostles' teaching and does not follow the teachings of men where we can worship and serve him and learn to live as Christians. And when we fall short after becoming a Christian, and we will, let us repent and pray as fallen Christians that the Lord will forgive us of our sins. If anyone is subject to that gracious invitation, we would encourage all to come, all to come wherever you may hear our voice. And those in this area or wherever you are, we will try to put you in touch with those who can assist you at any time. If you're here today and subject to the gospel invitation, we hope that you will come before it is too late as we close the lesson for now.